be out there for people. Okay. Excellent. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Drupal NYC Meetup for November 2021. Uh, we're glad you joined us. If uh, you're in, we uh, hope you will turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. Um, I think I'm ahead of the slide. I got the agenda up right now. Sorry about that. But we're just getting started. Um, sorry. All right, here we go. Yeah, so please turn on your video if you're comfortable doing that. Um, mute yourself when not speaking. Also, we have a Slack channel, which you can see some down in the bottom of the slide. We list that. If you want to ask a question or have any conversation around this meetup, it'd be great to do it in our Slack channel so there's a history. Otherwise, when we close out the Zoom meeting, the conversation goes with it. Uh, so yeah, join us in Slack if you haven't and join us in the meetup channel to discuss the goings-ons of tonight. The agenda for tonight is we will do some introductions. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a job fair if anybody's looking or offering Drupal or Drupal-related work. Uh, Amy June is joining us to give a uh, presentation. Um, and then we're available for some problem-solving problem time and uh, social hour for some virtual socializing. Today's meetup was brought to you by these organizers, uh, part of the Drupal NYC. We'd love to have your help and have you join this team. In that same Slack channel, you could find, or this, yeah, Slack organization, you could find the channel meetup-organize. If you join that channel, uh, let us know how you'd like to help, and, and we'd love to have the help and, and to get to know you better. You can find us on Twitter at Drupal NYC and again, our Slack channel here. So join the community. We'd love to hear from you more and hope to see you on the interwebs at these places. We wanted to call out the Drupal Association. The Drupal Association does so much for Drupal uh, by you know, maintaining everything that we do with the product of Drupal, but also supporting the community and being there for us. Um, so if you can, please support the Drupal Association. It's uh, you know, kind of do what you could do, and uh, it makes a big difference. And the address there, drupal.org slash association. So thank you, Drupal Association. We want to announce some upcoming events. There's the New England Drupal Camp, known as Ned Camp. That's on November 19th. Um, the Florida Drupal Camp is coming up in February. We were just having a little pre-conversation about how nice the weather is in Florida in February. So, you know, make your plans to get to that Drupal camp. I believe it's going to be in person or they're, they're trying hard to make that happen. So keep that uh, in mind. And then MidCamp 2022 is scheduled for mid-March. You can find out more about these events at drupal.org slash community slash events. Drupal NYC has lunch and learns in addition to this style of meetup. The lunch and learns are on the third, third Tuesday of every month at noon. Um, we keep it to exactly an hour so that you can schedule it and not interfere with your work time. And it's a great way to uh, break up your work day, spend some company time learning something Drupal. Um, you know, so join us, bring your lunch, and uh, there are always great talks. There's also a newsletter you can subscribe to. Uh, we've got a link here. It's a bit.ly link, bit.ly uh, slash DNYC hyphen mailing hyphen list. And if you go there, you can subscribe to a newsletter that will keep you up to date about all these meetups, including the lunch and learn. Are you interested in speaking? We have the lunch and learns, and we have this style of meetup in the evenings, and we'd be interested to have any presentation of any length. It can be uh, beginner topics. It can be advanced topics. We also encourage non-Drupal topics. Anything you think this Drupal community might be interested in hearing, we'd love for you to give a talk. So get in touch with us. You can email us at speak at drupalnyc.org. And as mentioned, there is a Slack community uh, called Drupal NYC, and there's a channel in there, hashtag meetup. Reach out to any of us there, and we would love to have you give a presentation. Speaking of that job fair, let's take a moment and see if anybody is hiring or anybody is looking for some work. 
Um, if you are, raise your hand and let us know. Amy June. Um, I work with Canopy Studios. Um, we do half WordPress, half Drupal, but mostly, well, not half and half, mostly Drupal, um, support to build all the different things. And um, we're looking for creatives right now versus developers like uh, UX design, um, uh, graphic design. And then also um, we're looking for an IT specialist, which is sort of a new role for us. Um, we had a someone doing it part-time but we've expanded so much that we need a full-time it person to help us set up computers and run our help desk and stuff like that and that's k-a-n-o-p-i canopy i assume that the it person has to be local no we're fully distributed we haven't had an office in all of the times that we've existed so we have someone fix up the computers and ship them out really mm -hmm. that's interesting Mm -hmm. When you say full time, is that like 40 hours a week or? Or like 35 to 40, you know, because we have like built in time for contrib and staffing and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity. Scott? I'm looking for people who want to do sweat equity for my uh, data management, data manipulation system. Front end is Drupal for the heavy lifting ACL. MongoDB for the data stores of the attributes of the other data items. Not using MongoDB for Drupal, but we still use SQL for that, but all the data gets stored in Mongo so you can manipulate and play with it and add to it at will. And I'm trying to get the next levels to get to get the first round of serious funding. Now that I'm getting clients Sounds on great. board. I also, I have some opportunities. There's a uh... Uh, working with me, I have an RFP out for somebody to help us with Google Tag Manager. So it will be within Drupal. We're tracking all of our measurements right now using kind of like the old fashioned in mind clicks and stuff like that and JavaScript to apply events. And we want to convert all that to GTM. Uh, so there's an RFP and a plan written, but we really could use an expert that could uh, drive it to completion. Um, also hey. looking for anybody that, go ahead, Scott. Hey, I'm sorry. Jed, is the GTM, is that full-time or is that a project? It's a project, yeah. So, okay. And it's uh, ideally a Q4 project. So we're looking for a quick availability, but you know, I also know the reasonability of that. So, But let me know if you're interested. Um, it, it's well written up, so. Where, where, can, find, where, where will we find that? I can send it to you. Uh, I'll post this in the job in that same Slack community, there's a channel for job post. I'll put that in there and, and Scott, I'll reach out to you also okay. uh, with the RFP. Uh, anybody else doing Drupal 8, Drupal 9 upgrades? As we all know that the Drupal 9 uh, is here and I could use some help with those type of projects. So if you've specialized in any of those upgrades, uh, especially with like custom modules, not really contrib, please let me know. Um, and then I also go ahead, Scott. If you reach out to me, I'm about to start doing that for about eight different sites. <laughs> right, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I bet a lot of people are. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I also I know of a role opening up at a healthy living company. I, I believe it's Weight Watchers, and they're looking to replace a role uh, that will be kind of a mix, mostly back end Drupal, all Drupal work. Um, it, they're posting as a 90 day position with the opportunity to go full time. So if you'd like to work with a brand like that, you know, uh, I work in healthy living and, and healthcare, and I think it's an awesome opportunity. So I will also that job posting isn't public yet, you can reach out to me. And once it's public, I'll put it in the job post channel also. So anyone else? And where are you based again? The Weight Watchers is in New York City. Um, might be virtual or remote. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. And you personally, you're based where in the, um, you're in mid-state, right? New York? Me? I'm in, I'm in the city. Yeah. Oh, you're in, you're in the city. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody looking? All right. So today's talk is by... Amy June Highland, and it's on the Drupal issue queue triage. And so with no further ado, I'd like to turn over the controls. Okay, so um, housekeeping first, I'm going to post a link to the slides in the meetup channel. 
um, because there's some handy links um, that you know you can't get off of the zoom screen. So let me share my screen. Okay, I had a Zoom update today. So I am assuming you see a front page slide. Okay, great. Uh, so issue Q triage, and there's a link for folks who um, are watching this on the interwebs and want to go later and um, follow along. It's bit.ly slash capital N, capital Y, capital C, dash issue, dash triage. Um, and I can't remember if that link is an actual exact copy of this one or a copy from the Drupal mentoring one, but it's the same information. Um, so issue Q triage, um, we're going to talk about like what it is exactly, but you know, um, as most of us know, Drupal is an open source project. And if we use open source, open source depends on us. And that's in the form of contributions. And you know, contributions happen all different kinds of ways. It doesn't have to be code. You know, you can give back to the camps, you can give back to the meetups, you can help with documentation. But a lot of pushing the project forward does happen in the code, in the in the issue queue itself. Um, but oftentimes the hardest part about giving back is actually like having the time, which we all know giving back and contributing to Drupal is a privilege of time. But once we have the time, we don't want to spend the time figuring out what to work on. And so one thing that the community can do is issue Q triage, which helps the next person along or issue Q triage can be your contribution. You know, it can be as simple as like going through the issue queue and making sure that people understand the issues. Um, I'm Amy June. Um, I work at Canopy Studios. I am their open source community ambassador. I get paid to give back to Drupal. And one of the ways I do that is by teaching people how to give back themselves. Um, I am a core mentor for Drupal contribution. So you'll see me at DrupalCon during first time contributor workshops. You'll see me at the state and local regional, regional uh, level doing workshops um, because I'm a self-described non-coder and I don't mean that to be reductive. I mean that I don't like to code. And so one of the things that I like to help with are helping people who aren't necessarily comfortable with code give back to the community because you don't have to know code to give back in the issue queue. You know, there's uh, documentation, there's like quick edits, there's UI fixes, things like that. And then I'm a member of the community um, working group community health team and Canopy. Um, we talked about hiring already. You know, here's the slide that says what we're hiring for some creatives. Um, we're always hiring project managers um, and then uh, IT specialist. Um, so I kind of already did the why, you know, this is the agenda slide. Um, why we want to clean up the issue queue is just to make it easier for the next people or make it easier for you for an issue that you plan to assign yourself. So we'll kind of do this thousand foot view of what the issue queue actually is, you know, and we'll look at like, you know, what it is on the broader scale and what it is, you know, um, honing in a little bit deeper. And then we'll look at like how to take apart an issue and look at all the different components and really understand the drop downs and the metadata. Um, and then when we kind of learn a little bit about the trip, the how to work in the issue queue, I want to talk about the transparency of our comments and also some etiquette around our comments, because that's important to be able to um, uh, make sure that everyone's in line, you know, and being very uh, communicative, you know, like like much like how the chat here is going to happen in Slack for longevity. We want most of our our collaboration to happen in the issue queue so everyone knows what's going on. Um, you know, again, the hardest part is <laughs> actually finding what what to what to work on um, but I I like to encourage folks to think outside of their skill set um, and outside of their passions sometimes and that's why having triage issues makes that path so much more accessible you know again you know uh, the issue queue can be overwhelming and when we have an issue that's broken down it just like lowers that barrier to entry. 
Um, so having issues and tasks triaged and tagged for a contribution event um, allows our new contributors or our existing contributors to have a quicker route to contributions in general. You know, scrolling through issues is really cumbersome. You know, we, we tend to land on one and it's like maybe too difficult or too complex to finish inside the contribution event. You know, this could be frustrating. Um, you're helping when you do triage by, by doing that first leg of, of groundwork. You know, the goal of, you know, um, doing issue queue triage is to have that issue broken down enough that anyone can dive into it. Um, we often do this, you know, in, in, in the time ahead of an event or the week leading up to a mentored contrib event. You know, we do see like global, uh, global contribution days in January. We often see contribution events tagged on to our local events the last day of the event. Um, and DrupalCon now is doing a, a, a different format for their program delivery where contribution is every day, where they have sessions and trainings in the morning and a contrib event in the afternoon. So when we like have these issues already set up the weeks before these events, it makes it easier for people just to dive in. Um, so when is issue queue necessary? And I don't want to assume anyone's skill set or level of comfort in the issue queue. So I'm going to kind of just go over everything. Um, and to give some context in general outside of like the novice issue triage, you know, when is triage necessary? Um, lots of times people don't take the time to um, discover if an issue already exists. So sometimes the issue is a duplicate and redundancy is nobody's friend. And so issue queue is the triage is necessary to kind of weed out those duplicates. Um, the bug report may belong somewhere else, you know, and um, over the, I think the last couple of years, we now have the ability to move issues with a single drop down into the correct issue queue, um, which makes it really handy. You know, sometimes we'll see an issue that someone thinks is in core, but it might be actually web forms is the problem. And so that's important triage, making sure that, you know, the work is done in the appropriate space. Um, maybe the issue hasn't aged gracefully, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, um, it's for an unsupported project, maybe, or an older version of Drupal. There's no reason really why we should have Drupal 5 issues there anymore, but I've, I think we've weeded out most of those and even a lot of Drupal 6 at this point. But sometimes you'll see like antiquated um, uh, antiquated or insecure modules, you know, having issues, you know, or the branches themselves. And we, do, we just don't, it's a lot of wasted time because people should be really using those up the, the most current versions of those projects. Um, except if there's security issues, you know, those are really important. And we're not really going to talk about security issues today because they belong in an issue queue all on their own where only certain people have access to those. Um, um, maybe an issue has uh, the steps are really uh, the steps to replicate are long and cumbersome, you know, and really confusing. You know, someone should be able to look at an issue and know what to do right away. Um, and confirming that the bug exists is great, but sometimes it's hard to recreate those edge cases. So so when it when it can be replicated you know make sure that you make a comment and that you say that you're able to replicate that issue um issue tags is a big thing you know um issue tags priority category components all of those fields might need updating and we'll look at those a little bit later when we dive into what the different metadata means um, and perhaps the person who filed the initial issue had only enough time to file the report, but not add any details. So, you know, maybe the issue needs a summary update. And then maybe the bug just can't be reproduced. You know, this information is important before someone takes a lot of time. You know, uh, remember, time is a privilege for all of us when it comes to contribution. But we want, we don't want someone to work on something you know, find a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Again, you know, stepping back, you know, looking at the 100 foot view of the issue queue, it's really good to understand all of those bits and pieces. So I have an image up here of the Drupal core 
before I say Drupal core, yeah, Drupal core issue queue. Um, and it's a screenshot. So you see, you know, uh, you see issues for Drupal core. There's a couple of links at top, across the top. There's some um, fields that people refer to as metadata. Um, the filters on the top of the page we use to help refine our search. You know, this is handy if your con contribution event is working on something specific. Like maybe your event um, invited the easy out of the box folks to give talks and prep contributions for Contrib Day. You know, narrowing the search in those fields to Claro or Layout Builder is helpful. Um, and you know, maybe some people want to work on a specific version of Drupal. You may have more Drupal 7 developers in your crowd than Drupal 8, you know, and you can use those filters to refine the, the queue. Um, and then you can also see there's some important metadata across the columns, and some of these are filterable. Uh, the issue queue is color coded by what status the issue is in, you know. Um, for those that can't see colors, they're like pastel colors across the queue. But what's nice is not only are they color coded, but they're also in that status column, they relate to the colors. So in this picture, we see needs work and it's pink, needs review is yellow. Um, but you know, if, if, if you're visual and you can see the colors, it's a really like, say you only have enough time to review an issue, those colors are really apparent and kind of help um, narrow down that search. Um, and there's different colors that aren't there. There's like green for, for fixed and a light green for reviewed and tested by the community. I think postponed is a light blue color, you know. So um, after you get a, a handle of working in the issue queue, you'll be more familiar with those color codes. And then there's also data that's not shown by default. And we can use that advanced search button um, option to expand our search some more. So here's the search by default and I select the advanced search button and you can see we have more data now to filter by. Um, you know, now we see a tags search um, and tags are really helpful. You know, they're helpful if someone has gone done and, and done that first round of triage, you know, especially for an event, like if we did Drupal Camp New York City, you know, we maybe tag NYC 2021. Um, but we can also search by who is assigned the issue as well, as well as who is following the issue. Um, I was working on an issue last summer with Anto, but couldn't quite remember what it was that we were working on. And I could type his username in the followers field and see what issues um, he was working on or watching. Um, so that's pretty handy when you're at a contrib event and you worked on multiple issues, but, you, but maybe only remember the person that you were working with. Um, now, I talk about this a little bit more, how you don't have to rely on that later, but um, when you comment on an issue, you're, you automatically follow an issue. So if you are interested in an issue, there's a couple of different ways to follow that. Um, so here's another screenshot of that issue queue, you know, but further down. Um, you can see that the arrows, there's different arrows and different things circled. You know, we want to make sure that our contributors are successful and have a sense of accomplishment. Um, so I suggest staying away from certain kinds of issues for, say, you don't have a lot of time or you're new. Um, this includes issues in projects that aren't actively maintained. Um, this can be discouraging for some new contributors or even existing contributors, you know, because sometimes those maintainers only look at their project every few months or years, you know, and it's nice to have something that immediate feedback, right? So stay away from those issues, uh, the projects that aren't actively maintained. Um, if a project has multiple issues that are marked won't fix, this could be an indication that the maintainer isn't receptive to changes in their project. Um, but that's not always the case. It could be that someone filed some issues that, were, that weren't really relevant, or maybe they were feature requests that were out of line. Um, but sometimes when you see it won't fix over and over and over again, it just means that there's not a collaborative um, sense to the project. Um, issues that aren't current, you know, um, issues that haven't been moved in over three months. Sometimes um, if, if you only have a little bit of time um, or maybe the time you have is 
like once a month or once every couple of months, you know, staying away from issues that don't move quickly um, is, is, is a good thing. And then issues that have over 10 comments, um, this could be, they could have lots of comments for different reasons. It could mean that the status changed lots of times, that the, the, there's lots of discussion. So again, you know, just saying you won't work on anything with over 100 comments is sort of a blanket statement. But after a while, you get kind of used and you can see banter in the queue. Um, you can see arguments in the issue queue sometimes. And as someone with limited time or as a new contributor, staying out of arguments is always a good thing, you know? Um, it's not fun to be combative in the issue queue. And then remember, you know, if we're tagging issues for um, novices, you know, be mindful of the priority of the issue. You know, uh, issues can be critical, they can be marked normal, they can be minor, you know, and if you're just beginning in the issue, you could be a Drupal developer for years and never have worked in the issue queue. So there's kind of two, when I say new contributor, there's two different kinds of contributors. There's new to the issue queue and new to Drupal. But you know, um, either way, like a critical issue might not be the best place to start, you know? And so when we triage issues and make sure that we have all of that metadata correct, it helps us discern whether or not it's worth working on. So breaking it down even further, you know, here's this life cycle of an issue, you know, someone, hopefully searches the issue queue, make sure that it doesn't already exist, um, and then they create an issue, you know? And as we create an issue, the default is that it's marked as active. Um, so people discuss and they collaborate, you know, and they upload solutions, and then it moves into needs review. And as someone needs, as someone reviews it, you know, um, someone can mark it as needs work, you know, maybe it didn't do exactly what we wanted. Maybe the coding standards aren't up to date. Maybe the patch doesn't apply or needs to be re-rolled. Um, or, you know, after needs review, it can be marked reviewed and tested by the community. And then after that, it's, you know, approved and merges into things. Um, and this doesn't have anything to do with triage, but I want to comment on that reviewed and tested by the community um, aspect, you know, that RTBC. Reviewing isn't a shorter process than patching. Reviewing can be really straightforward, but we also want to make sure that when we review issues, that we review them thoroughly. You know, if it's a documentation issue, make sure that you check for grammar, that you check for spelling, that you check that the links aren't antiquated. Um, if it's a more complicated core issue, you wanna make sure that maybe it, you run tests against it. But the reason I mention this is, when you mark something RTBC or reviewed and tested by the community, it's nice that you write down what you tested and why you think it's ready instead of just saying looks good and marks it RTBC, be specific of what things that you checked for because the maintainer can really appreciate that because when they know that you've been thorough and if you've listed all of these things, they, they can go back and look and see that you might've missed a step that they might have checked for. So I really encourage people if they're going through the issue queue and they're marking things reviewed and tested by the community that they write a meaningful content just like you would with any other comment. Um, it's really hard when I see someone just say RTBC or the second person come in because some core issues we really want more than one person to review where they write RTBC plus one. That adds absolutely no value anyway. That might be, that's very tangential, but um, just be transparent. Um, and so looking at that metadata that we saw across uh, when we open an issue, um, I have an image on the next slide for those that are, uh, that learn more visually, but you know, we have a title, you know, the title should be descriptive yet not accusatory or aggressive. You know, we want to have very good etiquette um, we want to include any keywords in our title that might help when people are searching for the issue, say they found something, you know, um, uh, before they file another, they, before they file a redundant issue, hopefully they've searched and if your keywords are spot on, you know, they might be able to find it. Um, and this is an important part of triage too, is if you have a title and you have no idea what this issue is about, read the summary and correct the title. 
um, category, you know, is it a bug report, is it a feature request, is it support, is it a roadmap or a start of an idea. We have a priority field, um, critical, you know, does this bug produce a white screen of death? Does it stop the show? You know, are you getting a message your website encountered a problem? You know, and then we have major and normal and minor, you know, uh, things like a typo or an antiquated URL that redirects might be a minor, um, minor uh, uh, issue. By default, it's marked normal. And then we have that status that we looked at, you know, active, needs work, you know, RTBC reviewed and tested by the community. Um, and just because an issue has been reviewed and tested by the community doesn't always mean that it's done. You know, maintainers always appreciate more testing, you know, especially on core issues. And it's okay to review more than once, you know, and again, be specific um, with your comments. You know, a version, what version or branch of the project um, are you working on? Um, component, uh, this metadata changes According to the project core, of course, it's always the same, but you know, if you have stage file proxy and you have um, smart trim, the components might be different because that's something when you set up the project that you can you know, create those own labels. Tags, um, tags is a uh, text field, but autocomplete is our friend. And I always want to tell people that there are very few reasons why you would ever need to create a new tag. So let autocomplete be your friend. Um, my favorite example is a couple of years ago, we were looking at all the tags and we found the word accessibility spelled wrong three times. So, <laughs> so let autocomplete do your work for you. And I talk more about tags a little bit more in the presentation. And then assigned, um, you have the ability to assign yourself a um, issue. Uh, this can be tricky. I typically don't encourage people to assign themselves core issues. Let the maintainers do that. But if it's in a maintained pro or in a contributed project, that I think that that's okay. Um, other people might feel differently than that. But um, Sometimes I'll assign myself a core issue um, if I'm mentoring folks at an event and perhaps the issue doesn't get resolved during the event and I want to hold space for that issue so we can work on it like via Zoom later on. Um, but be very mindful about assigning yourself things. And this, I think I talk about this a little bit later on too when I talk about issue queue etiquette. Um, but my general, kind of rule is, you know, be really careful assigning yourself core issues. And then if you assign yourself a contrib issue, make sure that you work on it. And then there's the summary field. This is a long text field with a editor with a WYSIWYG. Um, and that's where we break down the issue and explain what the goals of the issue are. So here's that image I um, I promised, you know, here's all that metadata across the top, you know, that clean, concise, oh, look, title is spelled wrong. So if someone was searching for title, they might not find this issue. Um, again, you know, we're working on Drupal core, there's a version, there's a component, this is documentation, no one is assigned themselves. And then those issue tags, this you can see in, in, um, in action, that autocomplete, I want documentation and so documentation comes up and instead of typing that out myself, I'm just gonna let that auto populate for me. I'm gonna click on it. And then our issue summary, and this is really where a lot of the triage happens. Um, there's an image up here. Um, in the last maybe year, maybe less than that, the issue queue now injects a summary template, which is really nice. You don't have to use it, but it's really handy because it gives you some things to think about while you're creating this issue, you know. Um, it's pretty bare bones, you know, if you need more explanation to what the fields mean, um, you can uh, navigate this link that I have up here and it breaks down what all the different um, headings are. But we have problem and motivation, you know, this is a brief statement describing why the issue was filed. Um, next, there are steps to reproduce, you know, um, it's important to be very clear here, 
no extra fluff and cruft, you know, perhaps a line by line instructions, you know, explain the expected results versus the actual results, you know, why, why you're filing the issue. Um, it's important to map this information somewhere. And then proposed re resolution. This is a brief description of the proposed fix. And often you might not know what it will take to fix the issue and that's okay. You can ask um, for help if collaboration is needing, needed. And then remaining tasks, this is more for core. You know, this section really needs to cover anything that would prove useful to someone coming in and hoping to help with the issue, you know. Um, are there tugboat instances for the folks to, um, to use to test? Um, do automated tests still have to be written? You know, is cross-browser testing required? Does documentation need to be updated? You know, because um, there's many steps to, you know, resolving some issues. User interface changes, um, a list of changes to the UI. You know, are things going to look different or have different paths once the fix is enabled? API changes, you know, a description of any API changes and additions. And then data model changes. This is a description of any database or configuration data model changes that make the stored data that you have on an existing website incompatible with the proposed updates, you know, so document the before and the after changes. But remember, this is a template. So some of the data may not be necessary for your specific issue, and that's okay. Feel free to use as much or as little as you want. And sometimes when we're first starting, we don't even know what it means to have an API change, and that's okay. You know, um, sometimes I've seen people do, you know, not applicable. Um, and then again, a lot of times these last three that are listed on, on the image, um, people leave out. And there are special summaries that you can use and Drupal documents them on a, a special issue summary template page. You know, this is basically more options available for issues that might have a different scope than your quote unquote typical issue. Um, this page is a little out of date um, uh, as that first template is the one that's now injected, you know, so we already have that template. But there's a template for documentation. You know, these are issues that are about documentation and they really need different information from issues about software. You know, not as much information needs to be collected to be thorough. Um, there's initiative proposals or roadmaps, you know, um, uh, these, sum these uh, summaries um, for proposing a new ish initiative and these are really I guess I would say high level information that a contributor should know to understand what the what the proposed initiative is about. Um, there is a there is a template just for remaining tasks. You know, it's a list of contributor tasks that can be applied to an issue. Um, and then issues that include visual changes or potential for um, regressions that are visual have a different approach. Um, as well, you know, this requires a different issue queue summary um, and there's a template for that as well. On any of these templates, feel free to remove or add HTML components, you know, that are applicable as you go. Um, but it's a really handy page just to look at because it kind of helps you understand the scope of some issues. And then, you know, I like to break things down even more, you know. Um, so there's some general guidelines for these issue summaries because a lot of times when we do issue queue triage, it's the summary, the meat and the potatoes that needs some work, you know. Um, you should be able to understand the issue and its current status just after reading the summary. Um, so sometimes if you don't understand what's going on, you can scroll down the issue and look at the comments. But if there's any information in those comments that really help you hone down what the issue is about, that issue summary should be updated to include some of those comments, you know. Um, we need to use short, concise, clear sentences, you know. Um, uh, we want to go by reading levels, you know. The, the reading level in the United States is average of uh, grade nine across the UK. It's, you know, I think age uh, 
11. You know, so be mindful of using clear, concise language, you know, um, because some, yes, we're developers and yes, we're, you know, designers and things like that. And not to be re reductive, but we do have some folks who are new to Drupal, so they don't understand all those jargon and buzzwords, you know, so if you can break it down a little bit easier in, 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 in our summaries, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, use markup, you know, for better readability, you know, break up the content using numbered lists, you know, the code snippets, uh, the strike through, you know, these are all in the WYSIWYG um, now in the, in the Drupal uh, summary. Utilize line breaks, you know, because white spaces are friends. It breaks up the information and makes it more digestible. Um, the key points should always be identified um, rather than writing those whole paragraphs. Um, and as an issue moves along, the summary gets updated so you can include links to particular comments, you know, but you should not only link those comments and not reiterate the comment. So I guess what I said before might not be true. Um, so I've seen it done both ways where people will, you know, digest what's going on of the few of the last comments and put it on. But if if there's one comment in particular that kind of sums it up, feel free to put that anchor link in there. Um, and then the UI and the API changes sections can always be left to be determined, you know, file follow up tasks for documenting these issues. A lot of times, like I said, I don't know what changes will happen. So I'll let someone else come in and fill in those issues, you know, because we're, we all have our strengths and our passions and we utilize everyone's skill set, you know, when we collaborate across open source. So issue tags, you know, I promised again, talking about issue tags a little bit more specifically. Um, when do we use issue tags? Uh, tracking issues for initiatives that span multiple projects or multiple components um, is an easy way to track related issues as well. You know, and I'm going to use easy out of the box initiative because easy out of the box initiative is unique that it's three projects. It's Claro, it's uh, layout builder and it's media. So if we tag the issues with easy out of the box across all of those, then people know that they're all grouped together. Um, we tag issues that were worked on during a con contribution event because we keep track of numbers, like how many people work, how many issues were resolved during DrupalCon Europe. Um, so um, we do encourage folks to come up with tags for their individual events. Um, Classifying issues with more details about the status, especially defining exactly what, you know, quote unquote needs work. Um, and we have some specific tags for those things like needs documentation or needs tests or needs maintainer review or needs accessibility review. A lot of times these are core tags and it flags people on the accessibility team or flags a maintainer to review. And then we also tag when we track projects, you know, milestones or goals, you know, such as issues that need to be resolved before a certain release can happen. Um, we classify issues by other criteria than the default in the metadata, you know, um, we have all those metadata, but of course there's so much more ways we can break down our issue, you know, uh, defining the level of complexity by using the novice task. Um, I think we're working on a new tag called good first bug which is a little bit different than novice. Um, uh, and then, you know, things like, you know, does the patch is written, but maybe needs to be re-rolled, you know, or there's a patch and a maintainer would like it re-rolled into a merge request, you know, perhaps it's a security issue. So you can create your own tags, but be very mindful, again, um, that there is a list of tags um, available in autocomplete, but there's also a list of special tags. Uh, in this image, you can see that the issue tags that are in the sidebar, this is usually that, um, that right-hand sidebar in the issue. Um, if you hover over special tags, there's a tool tip that appears that defines that special tag for us. And there's a page on drupal.org, you know, uh, long URL dash, you know, issue tags, special tags, where there's a really long list of special tags in there. Um, these generally have a really special significance and maintainers sometimes track them according to their role in core. I really, I didn't 
I didn't know until recently that if you hovered over these links, there was a tooltip. So I find that really interesting. And then transparency. You know, I really want to encourage people to be transparent in the comments when working on an issue, whether you're putting up a patch, whether you're reviewing an issue, and even an issue queue triage. Um, remember, once we comment on an issue, we follow it automatically and we get an email to whatever email we have signed up for, for Drupal.org. Um, and we receive an email every time someone updates it. Uh, so we can choose to follow issues by making a comment in the issue queue, or we can, um, again, this is in the right sidebar, we can select that star and we will follow an issue. Um, when we change an issue without making a comment, the email the followers receive just states that the issue was changed. And it's not very helpful. This is according to that metadata, you know what I mean? Or even like when you do an issue summary update, if you don't make a comment, you're, the email is basically blank. It just says that the issue was changed. It's not helpful at all, you know? So if you make a, if you do a change, making a comment explaining the change, the email will reflect that and it eliminates the need for that person to navigate back to the issue to find out what you did. You know, it kind of relieves a layer of complexity to someone. There's lots of times, like, I just see, you know, issues change. I'm like, well, why? You know, and I go back and it's just the metadata or something. But when you're emotionally invested in, a, in an issue, you know, you want to know what happened and what you can do next, you know, basically. And then what are the things that you want to be transparent about when you're commenting? Um, I like to tell folks if it's the first time that they're doing anything in the issue queue, you know, be transparent, you know, say something like I've updated the issue summary while doing triage for Drupal Camp New York City. You know, this is my first time triaging. Um, let me know if there's more information that should be added to help people along. Um, talk about if you've used a special tag, you know, I've tagged this issue for accessibility because, you know, keyboard navigation changes. Um, if the issue is being held for new contributors, you know, I like to hold issues sometimes. Um, this helps uh, hold the issue for a mentored contrib event um, because we do a lot of issue queue triage leading up and then um, we'll find people like swooping in and taking those issues and then we don't have any issues left for the mentored event. So I'm, I'm pretty bold and I'm like, I am saving this issue for DrupalCon Europe, you know, and then when someone else comes in and does it, you're like, hey, didn't you see the thing, you know, and, you know, I'd be not, I'm nice about it, but I'm tagging this for a reason, right? You know, and if you're tagging it for a reason, just be nice and be transparent about it. Um, and then we will comment when we finish working on it and saying like, hey, thanks, it's back out to the public, you know. Um, and then it's also handy to talk about who's helping with the issue. Sometimes not everyone who works on an issue makes a comment. So it's nice to know who's at that table with you, especially during a during a sprint. You know, um, you could say something like, you know, I'm mentoring Scott and David, you know, and we're at DrupalCon Europe and we worked on the summary and review together. Um, and I do this for a couple of reasons is because sometimes there's a group of people working on an issue but only one person submits the patch. And so if you don't talk about who's working on the issue with you, when it's time to give attributions, they only give attributions to the person that put up the patch. But if you're transparent and you, you supply everybody's name, then everyone can get kind of credit for helping move that issue forward. Um, if I assign myself an issue, you know, I talk about it. I'm assigning myself this issue because I know the fix and I'm gonna put up a patch or a merge request soon. But then remember to unassign yourself the issue if you don't work on it or if you're delayed, you know, just have that courtesy and un unassign myself and be transparent. I'm unassigning myself the issue as I got caught up in another project and I don't have time to finish this. But I have half the work done, so including a file that, you know, has some of the changes. And then, you know, we're in those issues and we're being transparent and we're making comments, but we got to think about etiquette. You know, um, we all communicate different. We're, we are a global 
collaboration network. We all are from different cultures, so we just need to be mindful of that to start with. Um, so communication, you know, sometimes people can communicate very bluntly and that's okay, but some people can take it the wrong way. So there's, there's this part of making sure that you communicate in a way that's not accusatory or aggressive you know, you can be blunt, but don't be like deflective or, you know, um, unconstructive. Um, so as far as like things to do in the issue queue, we want to make sure that we um, we have the issue that it's in the right place. Again, you know, we have that field that that autocomplete where we can delete Drupal core and we can put that it's part of, you know, stage file proxy. Um, we do want to make sure that we read and we reread and we reread any relevant information before creating an issue. You know, um, really do your homework and make sure that that issue doesn't already exist. Uh, maybe it's slightly different and you can make a comment on an already existing issue. Um, but if you feel it's different enough, you know, go ahead. Um, we wanna make sure that we download the latest development version and see if the issue has already been fixed there because sometimes we're working a couple of cycles behind um, maybe we're on the 1.2 branch and 1.4 is in the development process and that bug has been fixed. Um, maintainers are busy. Sometimes they don't backport back to the, the version. So if you have a bug in 1.2, look and see if it's been fixed in that latest development version. Um, and then try to get help from the community by other means, you know. Um, uh, utilize the resources that the Drupal development of uh, the Drupal um, community have, you know, we have uh, support forums, you know, um, they're not very active and I don't know why, but you know, if you file your bug and you're not getting a lot of headway on it, you know, um, go to the support forums and see if someone has experienced that same thing, or maybe they can help you with the, with the issue. Um, Again, you know, I always stress this lots of times, search the issue queue to see if it already exists. Um, if you find a similar issue, um, consider whether or not your issue is the same or if you should create a new issue. If the issue is closed, very few people will see your post and some maintainers may delete posts as noise. So always check the status and avoid posting and closed issues. You know, if the issue is open and you have more details that could help get the bug resolved or understood, please add them. Confirming that an old bug is still relevant if the issue is open is always helpful. If you have the issue and you find that it's in a, an issue that's been closed, but it wasn't quite resolved the way you th think it should, you can open a new issue and you can reference that closed issue you know you can say hey you know this issue somewhat already exists but here are my outliers um, you want to provide a really good description of the problem if possible you know using that issue summary you know the more details our developers have um, it's easier to track down the problem, you know, again, what version of Drupal are you running? What version of PHP are you running? You know, what actions happened when you saw the bug? You know, again, what did you expect versus what really happened? You know, if the error came as a result of some of the code you wrote, you know, post that code snippet. Um, remember, a lot of people are volunteering their time, so being grateful in the issue queue goes a long way. You know, um, we have a very talented community giving their time for free. Saying thank you doesn't cost us anything except a couple keystrokes, you know. Um, and it makes that person who just gave 10 minutes of their time you know, a little bit happier in their day. They're kind of glad when they see those thank yous. You know, if you're a project maintainer, make sure you um, 
you give proper credit for everyone who assisted in fixing or you know doing all of the work that it took to 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 fix that issue you know um by making sure that you check their box when it comes to credit and attributions in the in the issue queues uh, metadata and then also come back and tell the community if a particular solution worked for you or if it didn't you know post your you know, if you posted a question or um, in the and maybe you found you went to those support forums and and you found the answer somewhere else, post a link to it. You know, um, you save people that time of having to track down that information yourself, because sometimes someone gives you the answer, but you might not know how to implement it. You know, um, there's lots of times where, you know, being a non coder, people will help me and I'm like, oh, great, that information doesn't do me any good. But I put the information up there for the next person that does have that skill set. It's always it's always nice to have that information for someone else. And then, you know, if we have etiquette that we do do, there's also etiquette for things that we don't do. You know, we don't report security problems in the regular issue queue. There are special means for reporting security um, procedures. Um, we don't want to be so generic where we say things like, you know, X, Y, Z doesn't work. You know, you want to try to elaborate and add details so the community has a better chance of helping you. Um, you know, using titles like the site is broken, fix it now, um, might not get as many results as something like, you know, the admin modules page is blank after installing the module blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So, so again, that clear, concise title and again, being nice about it, like that accusatory thing isn't going to get you very far. We don't want to be ungrateful. You know, it can be really frustrating when something doesn't work. We've all been there. Um, but don't take it out on the developer or in the issue queue. You know, sometimes some of these things that we come across, developers don't always know how we use the software so they didn't even know that the problem existed you know they might not know everything about accessibility and so um we just want to make sure that we're we're nice um and remember it, it's volunteer time you know we don't want to hijack other issues by posting you know our questions um everywhere without considering you know where it would be best to um to or a more logical place to ask that question you know um we don't want to post a question and not follow up with any of our responses you know if again if we go back and we think about you know how we how we found a solution elsewhere you know go back and say so you know nobody will mind if this causes a little bit of wasted time stuff happens they will understand you know um and don't take anything personally because most people will be very helpful, but some get harassed on a daily or hourly basis by strangers wanting answers to their questions. So getting snappy or being sarcastic in the issue queue isn't ideal, um, but it goes with the territory. So don't take things personally. And remember too, you know, it's a, it's a worldwide community and sometimes people just communicate a little bit differently. But don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, if you've made the slightest effort to follow the above points, you know, um, people will be really tolerant of any mistakes you make when you're transparent about I'm new, this is the first time I've done something. Um, don't assign yourself an issue that you don't intend to work on quickly. Um, don't use random keywords in the issue tag fields, you know, before adding tags, read those issue tag guidelines and really figure out if you do need to add a tag. Um, don't mark an issue reviewed and tested by the community if you haven't tested the actual changes. Um, checking that the patch applies is not enough, you know, you know, downloading the repository and doing get apply dash V or however you do it isn't enough you need to actually check those changes. If it's code, you need to open your text editor, you need to review the code. If it's UI, you need to open the UI and see if those fixes are done. Um, and with saying that, we don't wanna upload screenshots of the patch applying in our terminal. That doesn't really do any good. And remember, every file that we upload to drupal.org takes up space. Um, 
yeah, there's absolutely no benefit to adding a screenshot of the patch applying. You know, if you're attaching a screenshot, it's more for things that happen in the UI. You know, say you're testing for accessibility, you know, um, you're testing, I don't know, something like visual, visual focus. You know, you want to do a before, what it looked like, and an after. Or if there was maybe a typo in the UI, you can take a screenshot that the typo was fixed. You know, you can apply screenshots, but again, not that the patch applied. Um, don't change the status of an issue from fixed to closed. Um, an issue with the status fixed will automatically close and be removed from the list of open issues after two weeks or 14 days. Um, it should remain open for 14 days after being fixed in case there's regressions or um, unintended consequences of the fixed, you know. Um, so don't um, don't be hasty and you know think that you're decluttering the issue queue. You know, let that issue sit there for that 14 days before it automatically drops off. Um, I had something else to say about that, but I've lost my train of thought. Um, and there's also there's also to 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 talk about. Um, different statuses. There's things that we don't always deal with as contributors that we might see in the issue queue in the metadata. Um, when we're looking at changing the status, we might see things like postponed um, or postponed maintainer needs more info, or you could see um, closed, won't fixed, closed, um, works as designed. Um, but as contributors, really the only statuses we concern ourselves with, you know, is it active? Um, we change it to, you know, needs review, needs work, and reviewed and tested by the community. And all of those other, um, all of those other items in that dropdown are more for maintainers than for us. Um, and this is this this came from um, the mentoring summit. Um, this talk was geared towards teaching people how to uh, uh, issue, um, sorry, uh, go through the issue queue for the novices, you know, and um, we're recruiting mentors all the time for the Drupal project. Um, I don't know if people knew recently that um, Rachel Norfolk, um, Rachel Lawson uh, from the Drupal Association has resigned and is no longer our community liaison as of I'm not sure if she quit today or she quits in two weeks. So we don't have a Drupal core mentor lead. We're sort of in this transition phase. And so we're looking for more mentors to kind of help us out when, when we have these um, contribution events. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to help like with this issue queue triage. Um, recruiting and leading volunteers you know we recruit mentors for the actual triage themselves and then we coordinate the novice issues with the other mentors too by teaching them how to do it we lead boffs things like that and then you know mentoring volunteers and triaging issues and answering questions and these are all things that mentors can do that are pretty straightforward you know um Typically, there's a lead to help organize the others, and then everyone can and can triage the issues. Um, and then I have resources at the end. You know, all of those links that you saw throughout the slide deck, I have um, links to that. So that's the end of the formal um, presentation. I think I may have left something else about tags. Um, I want to say that there's only a couple of reasons why you would create a new tag. Um, one of them is if you are an initiative lead or you're creating a new initiative and you're tagging the initiative with the new tag, but also contribution events. Um, and this is something to be very mindful for. And this is where collaborating and knowing and having a buddy system within your camp, say, um, Jed and I are, 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 are working on Contrib Day for New York City, and we have to come up with a tag, but neither one of us knows that the other one has created a tag. So I tag an issue Drupal capital NYC, and Jed tags the issue 
uh, NYC 2021, but it's the same event. So really being coordinated with everyone who's involved in your contrib day and then letting everyone know at the camp what your tag is, that's an, that's an instance of creating a new tag. Um, but again, you know, going back to that, let the autocomplete be your friend. And then if you do make a mistake and you tag an issue and you spell something wrong and you, you can delete that tag, from that issue, but that tag is still in that database somewhere. So it will show up as an autocomplete. So I've gone into a channel and said like, oh, hey, I tagged this A11Y for accessibility, but I realized we're not doing that anymore. And so I think Neil Drum went in there and deleted that from the database for me. So if we do make a mistake, it's fixable, but it's just easier not to make the mistake in the first place. Questions? Thank you, Amy. Amy June, that was fantastic. I think I understand not just triage, but the issue queue a little bit better. Um, to understand a little the difference between triage, a lot of the advice would apply to just creating a new issue. Exactly. But is triage specifically for there's a camp coming up? The organize. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be. Um, but the idea behind. Like, especially when you're doing novice triage for like, because in Drupal, we want people to contribute, but we also want people to contribute and come back. So we want that first time contributor process to be very smooth for them. And so this is where the triage comes in handy, especially for those novice people who have never worked in the issue queue before. So if we have these really clean issues for them leading up to an event, they go in, they find an issue, they work on it, it gets committed a couple of days later. It's very satisfying, you know? Um, but that triage can happen anytime, like say you have, you you start main, you're, you pick up a co-maintainer for a project and that issue queue is out of control. You can't tell what's going on. You open an issue and it's just so messy that you just don't know what's going on. It really just does the service for the community to understand, you know, and again, like sometimes me being a non coder, I know what that there's a problem, but I don't know any of the other things. One of the tags that you can put in there is needs summary update. So sometimes people will search for that tag and they'll just go in and they'll fill that in because me reporting the bug as much as I can is better than me not reporting the bug. Is it ideal? No but I make sure I tag it in a way that someone else can come back and clean that up for me. Okay, sure. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And I'm also wondering if, if there's a contrib project, can I go into the contrib project and see some issues and, uh, and help clean up the issues so it's easy for others? Or is mm -hmm. it more for core projects? It's core. all... It, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. The one thing I recommend, though, is like if, if you're very invested in a in a project, like say you use smart trim all the time and you want to help clean that up because you want that to work the best it can. Going through that and looking at the issues and making sure that one, it's actively maintained, you know. Um, does it have a thousand issues, you know, like is it is it worth your time to go through and and smart trim isn't like this it was just a name of a module i threw out there so, but um is it worth your time to do something on a project that someone's not really working on you know and that could be something where you reach out to the maintainer and you say hey can i help you clean up the issue queue and kind of gauge their interest if that's going to help them out yeah but core, definitely, you know, yeah. um, and I think sometimes like for people who have never done issue queue triage, it might be less intimidating to do it in a contrib space first. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You don't have to be intimidated, but I think Thank that some you. people, especially on those issues where you feel like it's this big thing, right? And you're making these huge changes, but, you know, sometimes just breaking down that big wall of text into bullet points or like 
you know, they always joke on the internet how you go to a recipe site and you have to weed through everything before you get to the recipe. Well, we don't want that, right? We just, we just want, the, we want people to be able to engage, you know? So, and sometimes reordering the stuff in the summary is helpful too, you know, or going through and going like, oh, some of these tasks that are to do's have been done, you know, and striking through those, you know, we've already written tests, we've already, you know, done documentation. And so it's just, you know, all of those little things really help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amy June. I'm glad that uh, you're, you talked about rewriting the summary or updating the summary, and then that came up so much in the responses to David's questions. And, uh, you know, to me, I think it was awesome to hear that so much attention is paid to that because it is so valuable when it's a good summary. And uh, yeah, and I wanted to say thank you too to all the people d doing the updates. So it really helps out. Yeah, and sometimes that's an easy way to contribute too because it's sort of a one-off, right? Like you can go in there and update the summary and then you don't have to care about that issue anymore. I mean, to put it bluntly, but you've done something to help bit move forward, you know? So sometimes if you have that limited time of only having an hour or only going, you know, having a half an hour or whatever it is, you know. And getting because, those points on your profile, I mean, it feels great and, and it can help professionally too. It's awesome, so. Right, yeah. and then also, say like you have an hour a week if you do summary one week you can actually work on it the next you know so but yeah i think i think sometimes that's the easiest way to get familiar with the issue q2 is like if i'm a novice and i don't know what the issue is that's a problem right so sometimes sometimes like after someone's been like maybe just contributed a couple times i'll say why don't you do triage because you're the perfect person to know if the next person will know if it makes sense just like documentation, you don't have developers write documentation. You have people who are new because you want to make sure that everyone can use it. And then it gets done. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. Sorry, I have a lot of questions. That's okay, we have a lot of time. <laughs> uh, another one is, I can understand how with an issue, you want to clean up what the problem is Sometimes I'm reading through issue queues and there's a solution somewhere in there. And then five comments later, someone else says plus one to this one, this worked for me. And the solution is really complicated. And the, the maintainer hasn't taken the initiative to actually up, uh, create, an, uh, an, uh, create a patch, mm -hmm. like an official patch. Do you ever update an issue and clarify the solution? It, yeah, so what you can do is like either at the bottom or the proposed solution, you can put that heading in there, proposed solution, you can um, link down to that comment or copy that comment or truncate it or, you know, break it down a little bit more. But yeah, you can definitely put that because there is that heading in that template that says proposed solution or pr proposed resolution or something. But yeah, that sometimes helps because things can get lost in the issue queue. Because also like as we update Drupal, every time we update, it, there's a there's a issue that says, hey, we're on this version of Drupal. Hey, we're on this version of Drupal. So you have all these comments that are just nothing. And the, the solution is like six or seven up. So, and it's hard, you just scroll and you, it's when you scroll, you miss things. I think I do anyway, you know, cause I don't use a mouse. So I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> but anything that, that I think adds value to that summary, you know, cause like anything, you know, reading, reading one thing is easier than sifting through three or four. Yeah. And if the maintainer doesn't like what you put, they'll change it back. You know what I mean? It's like really, it's not, it's a WYSIWYG that can always be changed. So if you make a mistake, it's okay. And that's why I like making a comment about it too, is like, oh, I added comment number 14 to the, to the summary, you know what I mean? And then they were like, oh, okay, that's what they added. I wouldn't have done that. So I took it out or I reworded it. Because again, that comment about putting that up there, will flag that person, you know, because they get the email and they'll be like, oh, 
yeah, I'm thinking about this issue again, but I'm going to word it different for them. You know, so sometimes, like I said, like changing it up a little bit, flag someone, lets them think about the issue again, which is if they're working on four or five issues, they might forget or whatever, you know, so, but yeah, that transparency in the comment. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. And any other questions? I think uh, the theme of you're saying be transparent in your comments in, in the issue queue, I think this offered so much transparency into how the issue queue is managed. It, it was a really great presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Too. I wish there were more people could have seen this. It's on YouTube for longevity. So <laughs> that is right. And, you know, like, I learned years ago, like, I would give talks on things about contribution and there'd be one person or two people would attend the workshop or like I'd go to a workshop of something, you know, with someone and only one other person was there. And I used to feel kind of weird, like, oh, why am I doing this for just one person? But there's four of us here and four of us learned something new. So that's four people that can contribute to Drupal in a little bit more meaningful way. And I think that's huge. You know what I mean? Especially in open source, because it's just I feel like not as many people are contributing these days than mm -hmm. what what we used to. And I know that has a lot to do with virtual fatigue, but um, but it seemed like I know in the mentoring space, like we're we're struggling with like having enough mentors, you know, because it's hard to do it online. It's not fun. It's not rewarding. You don't go out afterward, you know, and. <laughs> Yep. Well, thank you again. That was fantastic. Uh, certainly appreciated your talk, Amy June. Thank you. Thank you. The next part of the, uh, this Drupal NYC meetup is a moment if you have any problems that you're trying to solve or anything you've uh, learned about Drupal recently or any tidbits you wanted to share with the group, it's uh, free form and we'd love to know what's on your mind. The silence, I think everybody's uh, Drupal pros and no questions out there, so that's awesome. Let's talk about the next event. The next event's a different format. It's a lunch and learn. Uh, it will be one hour. Uh, we keep it very tight on schedule so that we don't interrupt your workday in any way that wasn't planned, uh, but we do interrupt your workday in a way that is planned with a great presentation that'll be on November 16th at noon. Um, so we hope you join us then. And then our next evening meetup will be next month, uh, always the first Wednesday of the month. That will be December 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, so we hope to see you at both those events. Again, if you'd like to present, it's a lot of fun and uh, super valuable, as you just saw. So we'd love to have you. Uh, you can email us, speak at drupalnyc.org. And again, we have a Drupal community on Slack. That's drupalnyc.org slash Slack. And the channel specifically would be hashtag meetup inside that Slack community. So reach out to us. Let us know how you'd like to speak. Again, be anything from beginner to advanced, uh, even topics that aren't specifically Drupal. Uh, anything you think this community would be interested in learning about, we would love to hear from you. And with uh, that, we will uh, end the online or uh, the recorded part of this meetup and uh, attend our virtual after party. Um, so we hope we see you next time at the after party after the meetup then. So thanks again, Amy June. Thanks, JD, thanks everybody can, can for attending. You get a chance.